In this conversation, I talk with my friend Pamela Hobart, who I just did a month of philosophical life coaching by email with. It was a really interesting experience to be working with her to do some really in-depth uh, consideration and reflection by email. It was a really unusual experience for me and also truly delightful and extremely beneficial for me. So I wanted to talk to Pamela more about her background and how she started doing the coaching, what that's been like for her and her clients. And also we got into some sort of meta reflection on what our experience was like doing these emails together for the last month. And I really enjoyed this conversation and I can't recommend uh, the services and offerings that Pamela has highly enough. So if you're interested in, by what you hear in this conversation, definitely recommend checking her out and learning more. Hi, Pamela. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Tashin. Good morning. So um, we just spent the last month doing your philosophical coaching by email together, and I wanted to have you on to talk about that, both our month and um, the coaching service that you do, and just in general what you're up to. Um, and that's, that's really what I'd like to spend the bulk of our conversation on, but I really like to just start by hearing people's stories and where they're coming from. And so I'd be curious to ask you just to start off about your own history with philosophy and you know what your exposure to it was, how you got interested in all this stuff. And also, I guess where you ended up philosophically, like what your sort of um, philosophical leanings and inclinations are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have an undergraduate degree in philosophy. Uh, it's sort of piqued my interest back, that's a long time ago now, from um, Georgia State. And I started a PhD in philosophy because it seemed more interesting than going to law school, which was my other option. Uh, and so I studied mostly ethics in graduate school for almost seven years, which is how I ended up in New York City. Uh, I was studying at Columbia. And at that time, I made several shifts, you know, from sort of like a I don't know, like many people who are sort of thinking types, they get exposed to utilitarianism and it kind of puts their hook, puts its hooks in you and you get kind of curious, like this seems really right, this seems not right at all, <laughs> um, you keep going. Anyway, so at, towards the end, I was um, studying more like education and I was especially interested in moral education and how people's characters are formed. And I more or less uh, ended up as like an Aristotelian virtue ethicist, which is where I remain today. What that means basically is I think that the most accurate and informative way to think about living well is in terms of flourishing as a human. And that is sort of a sort of a naturalistic view in some ways that's based on what we know about the human animal, how humans tend to live, what the markers of well-being are. And it includes this very rich vocabulary of virtues, that's just traits that people can develop that uh, sort of serve them well in life, like courage, honesty, kindness, and stuff like that. Um, so all that was really interesting and great, but uh, academia is kind of a mess. And so I dropped out of grad school and just kind of messed around for a while. I like worked in social media and I worked at startups um, for a few years. And then I took some time off uh, having kids. And then basically at a hard time in my life, I ended up hiring my own philosophical counselor to talk about some stuff. So this is um, a woman in New York City. I would go visit her office in person. And so that's when I sort of realized that philosophical counselors were a thing. And they mostly are people with PhDs in philosophy who do like a very crash course in doing client work. And then they operate sort of like regular therapists, like word of mouth referrals and like don't really blog, you know, not on Twitter. Um, and although this, this counseling experience was really valuable for me, I thought it was missing something, which is that if you sit with a philosopher and you talk about, you know, how your life is going well, how it's not going well, questions that you have about moral stuff, um, uncertainties that you have about how to behave or what to believe. That's all great and you can do that and it's interesting, um, but it has, it has implications for like what you should be doing the rest of the time. <laughs> you know, like it doesn't stop in the counseling hour. Um, if you determine that, you know, you're sort of not living well in whatever way, then you should go <laughs> change something and do it. And so the missing piece was sort of what is more or less coaching. So that's when I sort of hatched this idea that was like, 
and coaches of course operate in this online way you know like they're posting they're on twitter they like have an email list um so i thought to myself like what if i could try being a coach um in my own way which is to say a philosophical way but that also incorporates elements of like did you do that thing you decided to do is it working <laughs> you know do you want to try something else or like double down and so that's sort of, um, I coined the term, I mean, I think I coined it, I coined the term philosophical life coaching for that. And it was sort of, uh, you know, nerve wracking. You just like put up a site and be like, oh, I'm not really a coach. I'm not really a philosophical counselor. I'm not really a therapist, but like, why don't you pay to talk to me? Um, but the long and short of it is that it resonated with people in a certain way and they started hiring me in bits and pieces. And um, that was around the time my third child was born. So I sort of just, you know, took calls when they came up. And uh, that's right about two years ago now. It was April 2019. And now I have um, about like a halftime practice that I'm actively expanding. Uh, and it's, you know, now it's a thing. Amazing. Amazing. Um, were there any, just going back to the sort of philosophical origins, I mean, um, a question that I have about that history is like, I mean, I've read Aristotle and been exposed to philosophy and um, there's sort of, uh, well, Aristotle lived a long time ago, right? And I, I imagine that there were probably some sort of neo-Aristotelians that maybe had an influence on you. It, would that be a fair assumption to make? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, or a lot, you know, relatively many neo-Aristotelians. Um, these things sort of come in waves, you know, like utilitarianism definitely had its heyday, um, like sort of within, you know, like industrialization and that stuff. And then um, there are neo-Kantians, right? Like all of these traditions are sort of still duking it out. And people will tend to start reading neo-Aristotelians when they've tried the other stuff. And they're kind of like, oh, this seems scientific or like this seemed really like rule-based, but like it has all these problems. So maybe we overlooked this old thing that's actually um, useful in these ways. Though there are live questions about what um, virtue ethics, sort of it's, it has technical issues that are still debated. You know, that's what academic philosophers do. But some of the neo-Aristotelians are people like uh, Rosalind Hershaus and Julia Annas. If you were to type uh, Aristotelianism, um, actually I would recommend visiting the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is an amazing free um, resource with really well done extensive pieces on this stuff. And you, if you were interested in the, the debates within Aristotelianism and Neo-Aristotelian, that would be the, the place to go. Mm -hmm. And were, were the philosophers that you mentioned the ones that had a particular impact on you personally or? Uh... I would, to some extent, um, part of why this work with the coaching is a good fit for me is because I am not attracted to really drilling down into very specific particulars about this stuff. Mm -hmm. I sort of have, um, I'm comfortable with having like a stylized view and sort of pragmatic way of holding these theories. So like, I couldn't say, oh, I agree with this neo on that thing and this one on that thing. Like, it's sort of, it's fine that they do that, but it's it's not for me, mm -hmm. um, which is why I left academia. But for instance, one of those issues would be, there's a there's a live question about whether whether you can have one of the virtues without having all of them. Mm -hmm. right? So that's an mm -hmm. example of, a, of like a technical matter for debate within virtue ethics. The thought being, that life situations, uh, they put demands on us that are like multifaceted. And, you know, you may have a situation where like you can choose between doing something that benefits someone else or benefits someone in your family or whatever. And so that may involve justice, kindness, you know, maternal or paternal virtues, all these things. And so it's like, both, both sides of the debate sort of make sense. Like, how could you properly apply justice without being like, kind and how could you be kind properly without you know having a sense of justice but i don't think we need to settle those to sort of make big improvements in our thinking definitely i love i love hearing how you frame that um so so tell me about the coaching by email i know that you do coaching with like one-off uh calls that you do sort of false belief fix-ups which I, I love the name for that um but i'm you know i think the 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 form of coaching by email philosophical life coaching by email is is really an innovation as well um 
And I'd be curious to hear about the genesis of that and you know what, what that's been like, what the strengths are of it, what the weaknesses and drawbacks are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I got the idea of offering coaching by email. It was September, 2019. Um, so I was, I was only in business like six months. I was taking a few calls on the weekend here and there and trying to like decide where to go next. And I have always sort of had this belief, which is like, if you're going to do this oddball indie thing, which is philosophical life coaching, like you can, you know, it, you can do whatever you want. That's sort of the whole point. So one thing that I'd noticed people had been frustrated at times with like their ordinary therapists is that there's no way within the medicalized model to charge for email. Mm -hmm. um, people find themselves like having thoughts between sessions or something that they'd like to, you know, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe this is an experience you had. Yes. Um, yes. People have thoughts and um, it puts therapists in an odd place because their whole work is to be really uh, good listeners and caring. But like, especially if you're, if you're going through insurance, there's just no way to capture any value for this. And the truth is doing email like this, it really fragments your attention and it takes a fair amount of time. So I thought maybe we could like do something here. Maybe, um, maybe there are like some weirdos out there who some people will see this like, oh, you're going to charge me to email you. And it will just be clearly, obviously not for them. But other people will be like, oh, I could see a use case for that. Like, let's take it for a spin. Um, and so I just put up a blog post in September 2019. The, the price was lower. It was like $100 a month for the first few months. And I was like, let's just get some people in the door and see what happens. I figured at that price, uh, it was high enough to weed out people who were like totally not interested, but it was low enough to like actually get some takers. And that was true. Um, people signed up. Um, most of them were strangers, which surprised me a little because my first clients um, for live calls were people in like my extended social network whose names I recognize. So some people signed up and I sort of, I sent them to the same questionnaire that I used for that intro session you mentioned, which just has some questions about like, what are you struggling with? What have you tried? Um, and yeah, just started going. At, at, I had to figure out what was the right expectation to set around response times. I knew that I could not be like a hotline, you know, like an email hotline where I'm going to be responding like in an hour all day and night. It's just, it's not e even if I could do that, I'm not even sure that it's good for people. Um, because the whole point of a space like this is to be like really reflective. So, so yeah, I just, uh, I started offering it. Some people it appealed to and it just started going. Amazing. And, and what would you say are the, the sort of, I mean, I totally resonate with what you said about the limitations of therapy of like being an, an sort of extremely online person. I would want to email my therapist and um, also knew that that was like inappropriate because they they're not getting paid for that it is like uh, essentially like emotional labor to do that and uh, not wanting to impose that so that was a big hole for me in in the therapy relationship certainly um so what, what would you say are that are kind of the like I, I mean some people certainly the people that they're like this is not for me they're going to be like by email like what are we going to do this is text mm -hmm you know, it's asynchronous, how are we going to do anything valuable? And yet, of course, certainly in my experience and, and, and those of your customers, there, there is real value there. So what would you say are the, the advantages of email, um, you know, doing this kind of interaction by email? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are advantages. Uh, I would say, before I tackle the advantages, Mm -hmm. I sort of want to speak to the disadvantages because they're very obvious. Um, yeah. And I just saw a piece. It might have even been like the cover of Vogue or something. I've seen this ad in my social media recently for like a mainstream magazine. And it says, you know, the headline, this is not verbatim. It's like talk therapy by text. Are you kidding me? Right. And so that backlash is happening because many people's therapy has had to go remote since COVID and there are startups, you know, where you can like text a therapist or something. And a lot of people are not happy with those, right? It is not what they were hoping for. It is like a clear second best. In some cases, it may be worse than nothing. Like if you are not feeling supported, then to text to some stranger about all your stuff, maybe like more emotionally costly than it is beneficial. Um, so I think that some of this is actually having a backlash 
for that reason. Um, so the, the drawbacks there are obvious, right? Like you, you don't get um, this sort of like face-to-face -face rapport, um, but the advantages are more subtle, but they're real. So for instance, some people, this is one advantage that I thought might be true and that was borne out to some extent um, over my 60, we just looked it up, my 60, I've done 60 client months of coaching by email in the past. It's incredible like 18 months. So I have like a, usually a few at a time. Um, and in fact, I think it was the first person who ever signed up has done every month since then. Wow. Um, so I have wow. one, I have one client who's been, you know, the whole time, which, uh, works for them. I don't think it's necessary for many people anyway. Uh, so one of the advantages is that it was clear to me that due to my niche, which is like very thinky weirdos, like really smart people, you know, my, my business name is Life Coach for Smart People, which is partially tongue in cheek and partially completely straightforward. Like, um, because of my niche, there are neurodivergent clients are sort of overrepresented mm -hmm. in that niche. And mm -hmm. so one hypothesis that I had is that there were probably people out there who liked my vibe, who would never, ever, ever talk to me on the phone or video. Like, never under no circumstances, even if I paid them. And so I thought like, is there some way to, you know, is there some way to like make contact with this segment of the market? And now I'm sort of experimenting with building some little courses and stuff, but I, the, the email sort of seemed like the most direct route. Um, so I think that that's true. There are people who find it in, like strange to think that other people would be more comfortable with email than in person, but everyone's different. Some people have a journaling practice that makes them uh, that makes them sort of comfortable with talking about this stuff in writing. Uh, that is sort of one of the markers of whether someone's a good candidate for coaching by email is, are you used to and comfortable with like writing things that you're not totally certain about or that aren't, are a little half-baked in some way? Because if there's a lot of inhibition around that, that's someone who might procrastinate on the email coaching and then like feel guilty and stuff. So uh, yeah, that, that's one of the main advantages. Um, some people, one thing that happens in conversation, especially about complex topics like this is that, you know, it just has a million parts. Like maybe there are three reasons for something. And so if you were talking in person, you'd be, you know, you'd be like gesturing, you'd be like on the one hand this and on the other hand this, and, but like, let's go back to that. And in writing, you can be very, you can be somewhat structured about that stuff and be sure that even if you aren't dealing with like all of those parts every time, it's there. It's there in the record. Um, if you want to come back to it, it's fine. It allows for this characteristic where maybe someone writes me several paragraphs of email and there's something that seems questionable to me, like they have an assumption or whatever in the first paragraph, but like they essentially got to say their piece without me jumping on them right out of the gate or being like, uh, let's go back to that thing. It, it's just sort of organizationally easier, but that's related to another problem, which is that some people are super intimidated when they see the wall of text that they've produced or that I've produced. And so um, you have to sort of, you know, take it a little lightly. Like we're sort of just spitballing to some extent you know, you don't have to answer like every single one of these things. Um, neither do I. And that's, that's sort of the sweet spot. Mm. Um, it's also just good for people who have performance anxiety about a live coaching encounter. So they may, everyone, not everyone, many people who've been to therapy or whatever, like the door shuts on the way out and you're like, oh, I forgot to, you know, I forgot to say such and such or something happens right after there. Um, and that can be a little frustrating, especially when you're paying a lot, you sort of want to like get all you can out of it. And then you didn't, um, and you have to wait. So, so it can be good as long as the performance anxiety isn't also about writing, then it can, it can fill a hole like that. And last but not least, uh, some people use email as an adjunct to occasional calls. Um, I started offering somewhere in there like a hybrid month, which is one call and then email the rest of the month. And that's a good choice for people who like, they wanna have some rapport. Some of it is really valuable to talk about in real time and just sort of like free form. 
but then maybe they have action items that I'm following up with. Um, or, you know, like I have a client who's doing hybrid months, who's taking a very heavy, uh, a heavily demanding cohort based course. So we meet every month sort of like, how's it going? And then they write me twice a week with like updates on what they've done. And it's more than accountability coaching because their choice to do this big cohort based course is tied into all this stuff, like their identity and where their life is going. Right. So there are philosophical elements, but we use the email to sort of stay on track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to maybe yeah, towards the end of this conversation, I want to go sort of more meta and talk about our time together. So just want to surface that like, really resonate with the the writing part of like, I think I think the singular prompt for me for doing the coaching with you was like having a morning pages practice and just seeing like, this is getting kind of stale. I'm just talking to myself over and over about the same things and like running in loops and just having someone to like share out loud to and see what you bounce back was like so valuable because it, it just really shook mm -hmm. things up. And um, so I totally resonated with that. And then blah, blah, I, for me, like I know the biggest benefit is like having a record of what we talked about and like I can go back and sort of journal more about different things that you said or like read it again or you know you would helpfully drop like different links in and I, I know mm -hmm. I can like go and find those later and um you know you don't get that with therapy like mm -hmm. um I guess you could like record your therapy sessions or something mm -hmm. I've never done that but like mm -hmm. even then um because it's like real time it, it there's just so much there and having a written record is incredible, especially, especially for these like uh, these issues where it's like let's go very deep into thinking about them intellectually and reflecting on them. That email is, I think, is really well suited to that. So props mm -hmm. to you for discovering this sort of means of engaging with clients. It's 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 wonderful. So thank you. Um, yeah, it's still a, an evolving thing. I think. Maybe, maybe there's even a way to market specifically towards people in this morning pages position, because I've had a few of you who are in that position. Um, it's sort of like, you know, up level or stop thinking in circles. That's the name of one of my little courses. Yeah. Maybe it can be spun with that or something. Um, yeah. So I know a lot more now than I did when I started about who's a good candidate what they might expect to get out of it and sort of how to make it go well. But, you know, email in general is sort of, uh, you know, people are over it, but they can't get away from it. And so it's sort of the deck is a little stacked against it in terms of a lot of people don't feel good when they open their email inbox and mm -hmm. it can feel like homework. You know, if I've asked like eight questions about their moral values or something, like, mm -hmm. it, it can feel dangerously close to like emotionally draining homework. But I try, you know, to be aware of when that's at risk of happening and like um, work around it. Uh, it. It is hard in writing to gracefully let threads go. Um, mm -hmm. I usually don't want to be the one to make that choice because maybe that's something in there that's really important to my client. Um, and so the tendency is for the thread to just like, just like bloat so fast. But I encourage them to just you know, everything I say is not gospel. There, there are threads to explore and to think about, but also be willing to let some of it go in a way that the medium does not invite maybe. Totally, totally. Uh, do you find any other trends in terms of what people come to you for, like specific issues that they really want to work on or like types of customers or things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, my customers are sort of, they're all, they have different lives, you know, like all different jobs. They're all across the English speaking world. Um, they, some of them are parents like me, some of them are not, you know, some of them are sort of freewheeling, others of them are settled down, whatever, but um, they share this orientation to this stuff, which is sort of, um, you know, thinking, it's very like cognitive. And so I try to, I try to help them with problems where they've thought about this stuff over and over and over, but like something is just, you know, something brought them in the door. Something about that thinking is like, is stuck or they still have like an element of cognitive dissonance or whatever. 
I think I'm really going to dig into this existential sandwich uh, metaphor yeah. that I came up with about a year ago, because as, as my practice rounds out its second year, I've realized that it really, uh, it encapsulates sort of the, the clients who are right for me, which is to say, uh, maybe we could put the link to the blog post mm -hmm. um, down here, but the existential sandwich was just how I, a way of talking about how I noticed that when all these thinkers would show up as clients, they usually spoke about themselves sort of in the following way, which is like, oh, I'm procrastinating at work. And like, I have this project that's late and my boss doesn't realize, but like, I really have to finish it yesterday. And I can't because... I don't think my work is meaningful, but like, can work even be meaningful? Has it ever been meaningful? Does life have meaning? But like, if I could just stop procrastinating, it would be okay. Right. So I, yeah. that's literally like how people sound, my clients. And so that's the sandwich, right? It's like they have something practical and then, then they end with sort of something practical like procrastination or making a choice. But it has like this very thick, um, like existential or moral core that they are not able to disregard because they're thinkers. Uh, and so it's really not clear what to do at these times when it's all jumbled up. Because it's like, do we try to solve the philosophical thing first? Does life, should we talk about whether life has meaning? Should we talk about whether you should quit your job? Like it's very um, hard to know <laughs> what to do when it's jumbled up in that way. And there are very, very many moving pieces. So that is the type of thing that I speak to people with about. Um, and at a high level, I think what you usually have to try to do is to find a way to think real hard about all that stuff, find something to experiment with or to try with like a hypothesis. So in that case, the person's hypothesis might be like, if I got a different job, then I would feel more meaning. I would feel like more, my food feel like my life was more meaningful day to day. And then we sort of go into like anthropologist mode, like do people you know report that? Have you ever had a job like in the past 20 years where you felt <laughs> more meaningful? You're like, so what, what's the evidence? How could you experiment with this in some way? And then we'll take what we learned from that and sort of bring it back to the table philosophically. Um, so, so yeah, I would say that's sort of like, that's sort of my ideal, ideal client. And some of those situations are ones that lend themselves to the written form because they are so like entangled. Mm -hmm. Do you find any trends in terms of like specific interventions or shifts that you find yourself suggesting repeatedly? Yeah, a big one that is a prime method for taking the pressure off having an existential sandwich on your plate is to decide to decide something later. Mm. So people often have things hang over their head in a way that they don't even realize how stressful it is. Like they have that procrastination problem or whatever, but instead of just working on the procrastination, they're also like, should I quit my job this week? Should I quit my job this week? Should I quit my job this week? And it's just like too much to be thinking of at once. So I say, okay, how bad is the job? Do you need to quit this week? Or do you think you commit could commit to say three to six months, right? Like let's literally get out your calendar and write, you know, September one, reconsider quitting job. Okay, great. So now within the space of a few months, what's available to you? Are we able to sort of rally and actually try something? Or are you just gonna like try to kill the time and chill out a little bit? Depending on the person, different things are right there, but um, just anything to alleviate the heaviness of the constant consideration um, really helps. And the decide to decide later is an important strategy for that. Um, I think also there are things that when people are sort of in a mental muddle, there are things that are empirical questions that they sort of treat as like mysterious. And so I often find myself doing homework, like how could you research that? You know, research isn't perfect, but like it's something. So for instance, someone who's in a big mess, um, you know, maybe, maybe they've had several jobs of the same kind and each time they hoped that it would be better and like, it wasn't. So they're like, oh, maybe I should stick it out. The pay is good, or maybe I shouldn't. Maybe work is meaningless. I'd sort of like to do, you know, become a product manager, but I don't know if anyone can do that from being a developer or whatever. And so 
when they're in that messy, confused, overwhelmed headspace, that sort of seems like daunting. It's like, I don't know, like how, you know, how could I ever know how to get there from here? And I'm like, could you search Reddit? You know, like search Reddit, like developer, product manager, like how can we just find like little bits of evidence about what it might take or whatever. And sometimes when people start getting those bits of evidence about something that is essentially a researchable question, it like starts to unstick them. Like maybe they learn about the path and it seems totally plausible. And we say, how can you take a step down that path? Or maybe they find something about the path and they're like, oh no, I'm going to vomit. Like that sounds horrible. Then we know, you know, that's, that's probably not for you. Um, so these are the types of things that it, it's not really like rocket science. It's not coming from like some encyclopedic knowledge of philosophy that I have. It comes from an orientation that is like, some of these things are very abstract and philosophical and some of them are not. Some of them are just get some information, try something. And, but when the biggest stuff in people's life is at stake, even being a little faster about the experiments or a little clearer can have huge benefits because it's like, are you going to waste a year of your life? Or are you hmm. going to, you know, move on a little sooner? Um, people know how to try things. It's just when they're up in their head, it's like very inefficient. Totally. Totally. I love that. I, I don't know. I think that that's such a um, judicious position that you've arrived at with like how to hold all of these things and how to really help people. So um, I'm remembering like the ways in which you showed up over the last month and really appreciating that. So um, yeah, maybe that would be a good, a good jumping off point to sort of like shift gears a little bit and just like um, maybe partially for my own interest, of course, but also I imagine it'd be useful for people that might be interested in this to just like hear a little bit more about what this kind of engagement is like, because at least for me, this was like, in many ways, kind of an unprecedented social interaction, right? Like I've had philosophical conversations, I've emailed people before, but the way in which we interacted was, you know, not exactly an interaction that I've had before. So yeah. um, maybe I'll just share a little bit about like, my sense of what the month was like, and then bounce it off to you. And um, just uh, curious to hear what it was like for you. Um, sure. So yeah, I was doing morning pages a lot this year and then found myself like hitting uh, like loops of just, you know, complaining about certain things over and over again and having the same problems. And also being at this like real juncture point in my life where uh, you know, I've recently left monastic training and I'm entering the world and, um, you know, the things that we talked about were like a lot about how to hold Buddhism and ethics and, you know, just some practical things like time management and um, also how to uh, detect if you're having motivated reasoning or not. That was a big theme. Um, yeah, there were a few different things there. And I'm curious about a few things like what your overall experience of that was like and uh if anything stuck out to you and i mean what i think one thing that i imagine was unusual for you was like i was really rooted in like a buddhist worldview and a buddhist ethics and uh you know there was some sort of like i imagine that was a bit different for you and i'd be curious to hear about that as well and yeah just any reflections that you have on the time and what it was like for you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah definitely um definitely your your commitment to Buddhism uh, was different for me. I've, I've had clients um, of different religious orientations, but I would say the more typical thing is that they have sort of too much up for grabs in their life, like sort of a real intellectual and moral like rootlessness. And so when that's the case and everything's up for grabs, we're sort of trying to find something to fix, however provisionally, like as a basis. And you had some of that already, um, which is good, good in a way. Um, I, I wanted to help you find some sort of, you know, comfortable place for, for retaining your commitments to Buddhism while also moving forward into this new chapter in your life. But I wasn't sure how much is actually available in that regard. Like cognitive dissonance is not always just easily fixable. It's not a trivial task. Um, and so, you know, just my evidence from previously in life suggests that it's, you know, shifting your relationship to something, you know, religious or metaphysical like that is hard. 
it, it tends to be hard for people unless they just like throw it away, which is also hard in its own ways. Um, so I try to, you know, take, take your commitments seriously and be respectful about them uh, and operating within whatever space was to be had, you know, mm. for, um, for, you know, what the precepts suggest morally, but also we're going to think about them and not just sort of take them at face value, that sort of thing. Um, I was in, I was really interested in your concerns about motivated reasoning. And I'm glad that that comes to your mind as a, a theme. That is definitely something that I'm familiar with. Almost everyone that I work with has concerns about that, which is really interesting because it's like, that's what, sh that's one of the aspects of working with like not ordinary people is that they know we've, we've learned a billion times from being out in the world and like seeing psychology sound bites that motivated reasoning is just like this completely fixed uh, trait of humans. It's sort of like universal and we have to be like constantly wary about it. So not everyone knows that or is thinking about it like day to day. My clients are. And I think it's one of the valuable things about speaking to someone else is not to say that like, I'm not a, I'm not like an expert. I don't always know what's morally right or, you know, but just speaking to someone who you think you have some baseline regard for who you think is sort of like has decent judgment or whatever can help to calm some of those concerns a bit because thinkers always are playing devil's advocate with themselves internally. And it's sort of good, but it's also like sort of crippling. <laughs> um, and I've been meaning to write a blog post about that for a long time. I'm going to write that down right now about sort of if there's anything I can offer in terms of like how to stop playing devil's advocate with oneself. And interestingly, I think although everyone I work with and, and me, we have like a cognitive first approach, or at least at times some of these things, I think the limits of that start showing up because if I were to give advice about how to stop playing devil's advocate with yourself, it would be like, close your eyes and think the two things. And like, how does your stomach feel? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't have um, uh, like a rule that's verbalizable, like in a sentence for how to tell. I think that you have to quiet the chatter around the argument and sort of feel your way to which one of those is like actually yours. Does that guarantee that it's correct? I mean, not strictly, but if you want to stop playing devil's advocate with yourself, I think at some point you have to make an all things considered decision about which of those cases is stronger um, or you're just gonna be stuck. Definitely, yeah. yeah. It's amusing hearing you talk about this just because like there were a few moments in our exchange where uh, Oh, yeah, I, I experienced it as like you politely being like, this is motivated reasoning, Tasha. <laughs> like I found it. Uh, and, and, and even while I was writing some paragraphs, I was like, oh, this is going to be a paragraph that is going mm -hmm. to be motivated reasoning. And that was actually a real gift to, to like start to be able to detect that, um, like a certain flavor or smell of this is the motivated reasoning. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and also, I think importantly for, at least in my experience, like through this month of noticing those things and resolving them of like, you actually need to articulate and honor the motivated reasoning and like get it out in order to move past it and grow beyond it to be like, yeah, I see that this was what you thought and that makes sense. And also we're gonna do it a little differently now. Uh, yeah. yeah. People have that experience sometimes when I speak with them in real time to like, they'll, as they say the thing out loud, I can see in their body language are kind of like, you know, like, okay, so it doesn't even withstand, it doesn't withstand being put on a screen, it doesn't withstand being said, but somehow when it's just like floating in your mind, it it's not as clear. Um, so I hope that that's a skill you can continue to, to hone um, as you move forward. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, was there anything else that you noticed or uh, experienced during our exchange that would be worth mentioning? You know, just sort of more of a procedural matter is that some people actually for the first like six months of, of coaching by email, no one used differentiated threads. Mm. Um, 
And it seems so obvious in retrospect that like different topics could have different threads. Maybe it was just that some of them were sort of single issue, <laughs> single issue coachers or something, or, or we were treating it more like a verbal conversation where you don't want to like say another thing until that person's responded to your first thing, you know, sort of like a more one-to-one -one give and take. But um, yeah, you seemed, you seemed um, sort of like a, a natural in terms of, sent me some threads, they were sort of differentiated uh, by topic. And when you had uncertainties about sort of where the conversation was going, you shared that, but not in a way that like made it impossible to continue or whatever. And so I thought you were a very good, very <laughs> model, model email client without maybe even realizing. That's funny. That's so funny. I'm wondering, like you and I are both on Twitter a fair bit, and I feel like that's probably a big part of it because threading is such a skill there. And uh, mm -hmm. it's interesting too, because like that you mentioned that, because even though there were, I think there was like maybe six or seven different threads that we had through the month, um, um, there really was uh, like a gestalt of, of the whole mm -hmm. conversation of like, this is what we're talking about. And yes, it does have these different pieces and subparts, but there, it felt like a bigger conversation, uh, even beyond the specific threads of like, I guess, like, if I had to frame it, it's something like, how do I hold Buddhism at this time in my life with the specific situations that I'm in and the specific problems that I'm facing? Uh, does that match your like sense of the gestalt mm -hmm. as a whole? It does. It does. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it probably could have only helped that we had some pre-existing familiarity with each other. Um, mm -hmm. It is something where it's a little weird that some people I've worked with by email, I've never spoken to in any way over Twitter or in a Zoom or anything. And so to them, I'm like this weird disembodied, like hopefully wise and benevolent <laughs> Like I might as well be, they don't, you know, I might as well be like a bot that's good or, you know, <laughs> totally. GPT-3 or whatever. Um, and so I do wonder, I mean, people have liked it even when it's like that, the email coaching, um, but it's a little bit harder to feel connected to someone out of the gate that way, or like they're being charitable or, um, and I did have only one, I've had only one what I would call like a genuine coaching by email failure. Mm. Um, just one. The middling case is like we, someone strikes up with me and then they sort of procrastinate and disappear. It's happened a few times. I think usually they've gotten something out of it, but it's like, you know, not, we didn't hit our stride or they sort of got what they needed or they realized it wasn't for them. That's not spectacular failure. That's just sort of like we tried it. The one spectacular failure was someone who just, um, it was very obvious that we, we exchanged a few messages and there was like, the rapport was like not helping. And then I tried to clarify something and then they like, didn't like the clarification and it was sort of hopeless at that point. And it was just, I don't know that it, that, it, that would have been a spectacular failure if we had met like in a zoom, I think it would have mm. been more like, oh, you know, I'm sort of not feeling it. I'm not going to come back, but what email does, and many people have learned this at work, what email does is because it's asynchronous, if someone gets misunderstood or something, there's like days before it gets corrected. Um, and that can be hard on everyone. And then, you know, sort of may not be recoverable. So it's not, it's not the expected outcome. It's not the typical outcome. It's not even happened more than once, but that's sort of uh, possibility. And so you and I were never, I don't think we were ever going to have that happen because we had like a good feeling about each other at the gate. So it could have been less valuable for you than it in fact was, but it wouldn't have been like a, you know, feud, like disaster. Oh yeah. I mean, it's amazing how intimate it was. And like the, um, I don't know, the few times that like, it got a little wobbly for me. It was just like, I we, we just like sorted out. It was great. So mm -hmm. uh, no complaints for me at least. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Yeah, do you have anything that you want to share or talk about that like maybe a project that you're up to or some of the courses mm -hmm. that you mentioned or anything mm -hmm. that you want to promote or put out there? Yeah, I mean, 
in the coaching by email vein, I guess um, I'm sort of, we talked a little bit before um, we started recording, but I'm sort of trying to decide where to take it. Um, in these 60 months, I think I've seen that it has a few different use cases, you know, so I'm wondering maybe if people who are hearing about it are interested in an arrangement other than like a full month. I'm very open to that. I think that for some people's situation where they are not trying to sort out, you know, their whole life, that maybe there's an opportunity to even do like a week and just sort of you, someone brain dumps their stuff. I like, you know, clarify some options and then they like go and, and um, try something. So that would be like sort of the unstuck version of coaching by email, as opposed to what you and I did, which was this like intimate long, you know, letter-like exchange. Um, so yeah, I'm just sort of, I will be experimenting with that a bit, especially as a result of this conversation. And uh, yeah, I have two small courses that I quietly soft launched because launching things terrifies me. Mm -hmm. And the first one, um, the first one is called Stop Thinking in Circles, which is basically a crack at a method for what to do when you get stuck in like a repetitive thought loop about a decision or, you know, judgment, whatever. Um, I taught that material. I taught that material as a class at Hyperlink Academy in the fall to like a group of 10 and it went pretty well and I wanted to make it like self-serve. So that was my first course. And now it has an email sequence to accompany it. And that's been really interesting for me because I've been sort of doing the method you know, like I didn't learn it anywhere. It comes from my experience and my sensibilities um, and my experience, you know, hundreds of hours of client work at this point, but to make it useful to a random person who buys the course, I've had to make it like sort of abstract, you know, um, cause I don't know what their particular stuff is gonna be. So I've had to like um, describe the method at a level of specificity that makes it useful to people. Anyway, so that's, um, that's hosted on Podia. I have like a Podia site. I'll give you the link to it. Um, and the Stop Thinking in Circles, it has like a little worksheet you could print out and fill out if you wanted to try to go through it by yourself. Um, it's pretty quick. And the other course that I just soft launched a couple of weeks ago is called Anti-Planning. Um, actually, its full name is Anti-Planning, Last Ditch Time Management for the Scattered. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I've had clients come to me who are really organized about their time. Some of them are like time trackers. They track every hour. That's cool. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for many of the people I work with who have these sort of um, complicated thoughts and complicated lives. And so I basically wanted to offer people an invitation to decide not to plan carefully, um, which is different than just being a haphazard person. It's, a, it's an invitation to decide to plan less uh, due to the cost and benefit ratio being different for someone who's not a natural planner. And it provides a method for doing like the first 20% of the planning and time management, which is where you get, you know, 80% of benefits and sort of make peace with that. So that's my other course. And that's something where like, if you worked with me one-on-one, -on -one, we talk about it and like troubleshoot it over time, but I think it's a basic thing that anyone could, you know, zoom through those 10 short videos in an hour and just start trying on their own too. Cool. Well, I love that you're experimenting with all these different things and they seem really mutually supportive as well, which is just neat to hear about. So. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think you saw my thread. I wrote a thread about it. Like it feels weird to be like a philosopher with info products and it sort mm -hmm. of feels cliched to, you know, move towards productizing knowledge, but I realized that that happens for a reason. It's that like you learn all this stuff by doing client work. And um, I, I'm never going to be able to meet with like eight clients in a day. It's just, I'd had four clients yesterday that I met with. Two of them were in my office and two um, virtually. It was the first time I'd done four in a day. And like, it was wonderful. I think the calls and meetings went really well, but like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. So I'm keen to find other ways, um, email and courses to help the right people. Definitely. Definitely. Oh yeah. I think that's part of why I'm excited about it. It's just, I can see that it has benefits and I'm glad that you're helping people. That's, I don't know, just amazing to see. So thanks for coming on today to talk to me about everything you're doing and help people check out what you're doing. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, yeah, if any of this stuff resonates, I'm always happy to uh, answer questions. You can drop me a line, find me on Twitter. And uh, yeah, we'll see, see what other weird stuff I come up with. Amazing. Mm.